We've been in this series of messages on conversations with Jesus, different encounters that he had, people that he met and talked to. And uh, back when we started and when we planned it, when Jeremy and I sat down and, and planned this, um, we knew that the baptism was coming. So I said, I know, I know the last uh, conversation. I may not know the rest of them, but I know the last one. I know how it's going to end because we're going to talk about what's most important. Uh, so in Matthew chapter 18, it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Which is such a dumb question, by the way. Uh, and he called a little child and had the child stand among them, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change, Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. So Lord, teach us. Teach us how we might uh, have your priorities and how we might know your heart and how we might change and live differently because of that. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this Matthew 18, uh, it it kind of gets to me because you know what adult talk is? You're, you're at church, you're at a party, or you're at work, you're saying you have adult talk. You talk about stuff, right? And and uh, you ever that thing where, where a kid comes up and is trying to get somebody's attention while you're having adult talk, and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll be with you in a minute, yeah, 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 sure. And the talk just keeps going, you know, and then pretty soon the kid just gives you the look. You know, you know the look, you know. The, you said you'd get to me, you know, you're not getting to me, you liar. You know, I, I, with respect, you know. And, uh, and so here we find in Matthew... Uh, the end of 17 and into 18, they're having adult talk. And if you look at what they're talking about, it's really amazing. At the end of chapter 17, they're talking about taxes. There you go, right there. Like every party conversation, they want to know how much taxes Jesus pays. And I, 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 you know, they're, they're all this stuff. And, and then, if that wasn't enough, then they want to know who's the greatest, really of all of us here, you know, who's really going to be the greatest. We know it's not Nathaniel, you know, and uh, everybody knew that. And uh, and so they're talking about taxes, which is money, and power, basically. What's the pecking order, and how about the money? Adult talk, perfectly. And Jesus will have none of it. That's the, that's the interesting thing here. He grabs a kid, because obviously there were kids sitting around, standing around, playing around, and he grabs a kid, pulls him into the circle and says, hey, unless you change and become like this kid, you're never even going to enter the kingdom of God. You will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless you change and become like this kid. In other words, there's no grown-ups in heaven. If you insist on remaining an adult and do your adult talk, you will probably never see heaven, according to Jesus. I'm just, I'm just reading it, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not writing it. Now, then, if you follow in 18, it, I, I missed this for most of my life. You all know that passage about, you know, the lost sheep, and there was a, or they, they had nine, 100 sheep, and 99 were there, or something like that, and one of them got away, and then the shepherd left. And you, you know that story, right? Yeah. We had that in Sunday school, you know, flannel graph. Okay, there the sheep, you know, go and get, the, anyway, I preached that, I've heard sermons on that, I've heard everything, you know, the 99. It's in the context of talking about this uh, becoming like the child, that they tell, he tells that story in 18. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I tell you that the, their angels in heaven always see the face of the Father. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, he's happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off? 
In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones, these kids, will be lost. I never saw the context of talking about children. I always thought, I always pictured, you know, uh, some old guy had wandered off in sin and deprivation and all those things, and uh, and uh, then, then, you know, you go after them and you share the gospel, and, and then they become, but it's not about that at all. It's about kids. The whole context is about kids. And, and I missed it because I was focused on adult talk. <clears throat> and what does it mean, you know, for us to be mature in Christ? And what does it mean for us to be growing in maturity and becoming more? Evidently, evidently, to become more mature, more Christ-like means that we've got to become more immature. Become less of what we define maturity as. That means we're going all wrong in this thing. Now, uh, I'm going I'm to share with you the lessons that I learned in Sunday school because I, I didn't do Sunday school well, and I've talked to you about these things before. Um, Sunday school was important to me because I grew up in Africa and we didn't have Sunday school. We, we had church and it went about six hours, but I never understood a word of it because it was in the Basa language, that we, the village we lived in. But, um, but when I came home, I was so excited to get involved in Sunday school because that was new. That was like... Woohoo! I got Sunday school. I was like the only kid in the world who felt that way, probably. But we went to Wilshire Presbyterian Church in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, near the Wiltern Theater, where they have all the concerts now. And uh, and I got to go to Sunday school every week. Um, and so I want to teach you, the. these are the lessons that I learned. The first one was, I learned in Sunday school that I mattered to God. Right. That I mattered to God. I... Up until then, I didn't think I'd mattered to anybody. And it was in Sunday school that I learned that uh, I was a real person, uh, that I counted, uh, that I had an opinion, and all those kinds of things. And it, it was shocking how, how that happened. I remember uh, one of my Sunday school teachers, uh, Mr. Nazarian, um, he was over visiting his friends with my folks, and uh, I, that was the thing I learned, too, is that sometimes Sunday school teachers were friends of your folks. <laughs> wow, who would have believed that? And, uh, and, they were there, and they were all having their adult talk, and you know, Westfall kids were squirrely and everything. And, and suddenly Mr. Nazarian looked over and went, Johnny, what do, you, what do you think about this? And the whole room went, <laughs> and I looked over at my parents. And they had that horrified look like, this could go badly, really fast. <laughs> this could really turn on us, you know. Just, But Mr. Nazarian was asking, so I went, I don't know. And started to turn away, and he went, well, no, really. What do you think about this? Let's just uh, share whatever it is that, that you've gotten so far. No adult had ever asked my opinion about anything up until that moment. I didn't think I mattered. And suddenly, here my Sunday school teacher was asking, what did I think? And, and I will always remember that as the turning point in my life where I thought, I matter. I matter. And Mr. Nazarian taught me that I mattered to God. And it was, he probably doesn't remember it, but I sure did. The second one is that kids are more creative than their teachers. Um, I had a lot of Sunday school teachers. Anybody here go to Sunday school? A few of you did? Okay. You know, some teachers were great. You know, it's like they're gifted and they're really brilliant and creative. And then some were just filling the space, you know. And, and But that was okay because then the kids would just kind of, their creativity would come out and compensate for the dull teacher. And that's given me hope, you know. Like in September when Eileen and I signed up to, to uh, help with the kids, I needed the kids to fill the space because I am so dull. But um, but that was an important thing for me to learn is that it doesn't all rely on the teacher. It's the interaction and what the kids come up with that makes it interesting. The third one is, I learned this in Sunday school, God's word is both interesting and uh, meaningful. And that was something that I didn't, um, I didn't get anywhere else. Um, most of the people I knew thought that the Bible was boring or that it was un not understandable, unintelligible. But in Sunday school, I actually learned as I look at the stories and things and hear about it, and I go, 
No kidding. Huh, that makes sense. And, and that probably changed my life so that I never had a time in my life when I didn't think that, that the, the Bible was not only interesting, but it was actually applicable to me. And that, and that it was meaningful. It was like God's word to me. And I learned that as a kid in Sunday school. The fourth thing is that I learned that I could, um, I could have a faith that was separate from and different from my family and from my parents. This was a really important lesson for me. Because up until that time that I learned this, I thought that, well, whatever my parents believed, I needed to believe, or whatever my family tradition was, that's what we had. And there came a time, you ever get angry with your parents when you were a kid? <laughs> Tim, thank God. Let's talk to Tim here. Okay. <laughs> you know, when you're angry at your parents, sometimes you think you're, you're, you're messing with God, right? And, and to have a Sunday school teacher who says, you know, you have a relationship with your parents and you have a relationship with God and they're not the same. So go ahead and be mad at your parents. You don't have to be mad at God. Really? I won't be struck down with lightning? No. Cool. And, and I was able then to be mad at my family for the rest of my life and, <laughs> and not blame God for it. What a, what a releasing thing. Now I talk with people over the years as a pastor and they haven't learned that lesson. And they think, oh, everything's tangled up and interwebbed in there and they just don't know that they can have a faith that's different, that's theirs. And, they, and that God wants to have a relationship with me and with you that is totally unique and unlike anyone else's. And you don't have to fit in uh, to, to follow, follow Christ. That was an important one for me. The fifth thing is I learned that I had some gifts um, that could be nurtured and that could be expressed. And I learned this in Sunday school. I did not learn this at home, ever. And I never learned this in school. School tended to stifle the gifts and not want the expressions. At home, just didn't, you know, there were a bunch of us and we just kind of ran around. But, um, but at Sunday school, I got the sense that there was a place for me and that there, there was, a, they treated me as if I could do ministry. And that probably changed my life. Um, The idea of, of that, that people actually believed in me and thought, you know, Johnny, you've got gifts somewhere in there, you know, let's, let's cultivate them and uh, see how they emerge it was so empowering, stunningly so. And uh, I've never forgot that. Number six, I learned in Sunday school that God was faithful whether or not the teacher was. Um, and this is this lesson has helped me as I've been a pastor through a lot of years, way too many years. Uh, God is faithful even when the people around me aren't, even when the teacher isn't, even when I'm not. And I remember uh, one night at our um, home, there was all this kind of a, t a quiet, whispery talk going on. And uh, you'd get on the phone and they'd say things like, Oh yes, I I understand, you know, and we're, and I'm kind of trying to figure this out. It took about a day to figure out that Mister, <laughs> I'm not saying his name, um, uh, my Sunday school teacher, who I loved and respected and looked up to and wanted to be like him, he was the greatest guy. He was having an affair with the associate pastor's wife. And everything came crashing down. And as a kid, I'm going, well, I guess there's nothing to this being a Christian. There's nothing to this following Christ. There's no, you know, I can't trust anybody, you know. But then I realized that God's faithful even when our teacher isn't. And uh, I've seen that played out countless times in ministry and in church. And... Um, 
People come to me all the time and want to know, you know, how can I go forward in my faith when, when look what they've done? I can't trust them. And I go, of course you can't trust them. Why would you? Look at these people around. Why would you trust any of them? <laughs> Why would you trust any of us? You know, and, and the fact is, uh, we, we don't have to trust each other. We just love each other through it and, and we trust God. So I learned that in Sunday school. It was a painful lesson for me. Number seven. I learned that I could be part of something that was bigger than me. Um, in Africa, I was kind of the center of my world. There wasn't much world around, it was just jungle, really. And we lived in a leper colony, so I couldn't play with anybody. And uh, uh, this is kind of me, and I had a pet gorilla, I think. Or a picture of me bathing in the bucket, you know. But um, you only have a pet gorilla for a while, <laughs> you know. Then you, know, yeah, then you become the pet. Yeah. <laughs> They're talking back to me. <laughs> but um, I felt like I was part of something that was bigger than me, that had gone on before I was around and would go on after I was around, and that affected different people and other families. And, um, and I felt like I, I belong. <clears throat> I really belong. And most of my life, I felt like I never belonged because I didn't belong in Africa. And then after growing up there, coming back to Whittier, California, I knew I didn't belong there. And uh, nobody had these experiences. And uh, But in Sunday school, I learned that I did belong. And, and I was part of something bigger than myself. And, and that's been really important to me, too. Now this next one, um, uh, I've, I've talked to you about in different ways. Um, I learned that there may be no second chances in Sunday school, but God is in the second chance business. And you know, you know the story about how at Wilshire Press, uh, like folks would drop us off at Sunday school and then pick us up, you know, later. And uh, I got I got banned for life from Sunday school. Johnny had trouble with his mouth, I guess. That wasn't bad. I was enthusiastic, but my enthusiasm may have crept up a little bit, you know? And, uh, and so I got kicked out. I got booted from Sunday school, but I couldn't tell my parents. I couldn't tell the family. I couldn't tell anyone. And so they would drop me off at Sunday school, and I'd wail and went around the corner, and then I'd go to the Rexall Drugs, hunker down by the comic books, and watch out the window until church was over. And then I'd come sneaking back through and then come out around the Sunday school building until you know, look like I had done that. They always wondered why I never had the art projects that everybody else had. <laughs> and I thought, I'm, I'm doomed my whole life. I'm going to just be hiding out in the Rexall drugstore on Wilshire Boulevard. I, I can't do this. this. This is just too painful. And, uh, and I said, Lord, help me. Help me get back into Sunday school. That was my prayer as a kid. And the Lord answered my prayer. My great-grandfather died. Thank you, Lord. Because he lived in San Diego. We were in L.A. I meant our whole family ended up moving to San Diego. They found a new church. <laughs> I went into Sunday school. <laughs> Woo the Lord took my great-grandfather to get me back in Sunday school. That is how important it was. Right? It was just timing, maybe, but I think it was the Lord. And, uh, and I realized that uh, in Sunday school, sometimes you don't get a second chance. Maybe you, you, you know, smart aleck too many times, and that's it. You're banned for life. But with God, it's always a second chance. Always. And he'll take your, he'll take your great-grandfather to, uh, to prove that to you. So if you love your family, you... <laughs> you know, don't push it. <laughs> um, number nine, I in Sunday school, I didn't learn this anywhere else. I learned this in Sunday school, and that was I learned to tithe. Isn't that weird? As a kid, we would we would bring uh, ten percent of our earnings, our allowance, and I got a dime a week. And uh, I got to tell you. That was so hard to bring my 10% offering to Sunday school and put it in the little bank thing that they had during the offering time. That was so hard because what can you get for nine cents? 
<laughs> Everything's a dime. I had a dime. Now I got nothing. <laughs> you know? Oh. And then one day I got a quarter, you know, and then I, how do you put two and a half cents in? So then I was forced, are you going to be generous and put in three? Or are you going to be a skin flint and put in two? <laughs> These are decisions that were big moral issues for me. I had to decide, what am I going to do? And I felt like then everything kind of got more expensive and you had to have a quarter to buy anything then. And it was like, this is not working. No matter what level of finance and income I've acquired, it's not enough. And it just seems to get more and more costly to tithe. So when I got a dollar and I had to give a dime, that was rugged. That was rugged. And then when I made six-figure incomes and had to give 10% of that, that's a lot of money now we're talking. I would go back to the quarter, you know. <laughs> Lord, it's all, you know, the idea of it anyway. And, and I realized there is absolutely no time in my life where tithing didn't feel too costly, ever. From when it was a dime to when it was much more, it didn't matter. It was never the right time on my agenda. It, it was never convenient. Still isn't, won't be in the future. So I live with it. That's what I learned in Sunday school. It's what we do. It's what we do to make God a partner in our, in our finances. But I never felt like I could afford it. I want to put that in again. Number 10, the domino theory is correct. It is true. You know, the domino theory, you tip one over and then... Um, okay, this is, a bad, this is an old memory, so you, you young folk, you know... Never, on Johnny Carson, I used to love that they that he would have a guy who could do dominoes and he'd put like 10,000 dominoes and do a big design on the stage. And then at a at the given moment, Johnny would tell me, push one over, and then it would just go like, <laughs> and all these designs would go up. It was really crazy. I think that's what comes to my mind. Sorry. That, I'm out of Ritalin, so uh, that's, <laughs> that's the one right there came to me. The domino theory is. If you find some kid on the fringe who doesn't feel like he belongs, doesn't feel like he's gifted, doesn't feel like he matters to God, doesn't feel like he has any gifts for ministry, doesn't feel much at all, and he's standing around on the fringe, probably mouthing off, if you can impact that kid and draw him into a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's possible that that kid on the fringe, knows another kid down the road is on the fringe and can help them feel like they matter to God and that they can do ministry and their life can be different and they can have a faith. And I believe that that is radically true. And that's why we have to love and invest in our kids, in other people's kids, in kids wherever we see them and find them in the market, in the school playground, in the hospital, uh, in church, wherever it is, we can't bypass them with our adult talk. We can't get to them later. Jesus said they're most important. They are the most important. And unless we become like them, we'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to give you one more. This one is not mine. I didn't learn it in Sunday school, but I learned it from Denny Ryberg who is the president of uh, Young Life, and we worked together a few years ago. And uh, he, he took his family down to Ocean Shores and uh, had a little vacation down there and came back, and we were talking about it. And he said, I learned the most interesting thing. Oh, tell me. Oh, great one. <laughs> you know, he said, kids chase seagulls. I went, yeah. Think about it. Kids chase seagulls. They, they will go for hours. He said, I watch my, my kids, and there would be a flock of seagulls on the beach, and they would creep up on them, and then they would burst in trying to grab one, you know, and then the seagulls would all fly away, and then they'd settle back. And then sometimes they'd just run at them full speed and try and catch them. And they, they, sometimes they just wander around waving their arms in the air just trying to catch one. They never caught one, but they never gave up. 
And I thought, that's a great picture for what does it mean for us to change and become uh, like, like the child. It means that sometimes we do something we know is not going to work, but we do it anyway, and we, and we love doing it, and there's great joy in it, and it's futile, but we just keep doing it. Because that's what we do. And so, on this day where we, we got to celebrate Nora and take a sacred vow, pray for her and encourage her and her faith and uh, all these things and to support the parents, I think it's time for us to change. Time for me to change. And uh, stop with the adult talk long enough to learn uh, from the kids. And uh, I'm obviously going to have to learn how to do artwork because uh, I don't have that gift. Um, so let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your care that reminds us that we don't have to talk about taxes and money and power and position or anything like that. We can just come to you as little children. And we belong to you, and you have so much to show us and to surprise us with that's going to bring joy and meaning to our lives. So, Lord, make us open. Make us open to you and um, give us the courage to chase seagulls around or whatever it is we have to do um, to get back the joy. And uh, thank you for welcoming us into your kingdom of heaven in a childlike way. <laughs>